Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, I've been doing some reading, doing a little research. You know, that's what I do. I read all I read all kind of stuff, man. I read all kind of information, historical, geology, archaeology, um, work related, company related, individual bi biographies, um, all kind of stuff. And this is what I came across, guys. So I've come to the conclusion. I've come to the conclusion that the gig economy, gig workers are the new rolling sweatshops. Gig workers are, are mobile sweatshops. That's what it is, guys. It's mobile sweatshops. And let me prove it. Here we go. Let's 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 dive deep. Let's dive deeper into um, what a sweatshop is, and then I'm gonna bring it back and show you how gig workers and the conditions that gig workers operate under, the um the, the corporate irresponsibility that gig workers have to do with deal with, the lack of transparency and the lack of government oversight. It's identical to sweatshops. Sweatshops are more um they they are more abusive they're more exploitative they're more dangerous the pay is lower but gig work is a mobile sweatshop it is dangerous people get killed it's dangerous for your health and your mind it's overcrowded it's abusive and the number one abuser the number one abuser of sweatshops just like the number one abuser of gig workers are the consumers the consumers make the abuse possible Because they start abusing a system that they see as easily manipulative or manipulated. See, so I'm going to show you when we read this, you're going to see how immigrants play a role in the abuse. Cheap labor always comes with a price, guys. And the consumer is always the one that takes advantage of that. Now, the corporate irresponsibility, they also play a role because they set up the game. They write the rules. And they change the rules as they see fit. See? So, you're going to see when we read this article how gig work is the new mobile sweatshop. Let's get into it. Sweatshop. Workplace in which workers are employed at low wages and under unhealthy or oppressive conditions. In England, the word sweater. Okay, we already know what sweater means. You out sweating. And the work condition is hot. You sweating. Whether you whether you in the summertime or wherever you're at, that's us guys. That's us. Was used as early as 1850 to describe an employer who exacted monotonous work for very low wages. Sweating became widespread in the 1880s when immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe provided an influx of cheap labor in the United States and Central Europe. So all we got to do is, is replace the word Eastern and replace the word Eastern and Southern Europe provided an influx with South America provided an influx of cheap labor into the United States. Mexico, Mexico provided an influx of cheap labor into the United States. 
an increase in in an increase in industrialization in in the 20th century saw sweatshops emerge in parts of Latin America and Asia, a trend that ex accelerated with increased demand for consumer goods in the West and a lowering of international trade barriers. Hold on, guys. Let me drink some water. Tell you, man. I'm in Arizona, man. It's no joke. Early, early in the morning. <laughs> Sweatshops often involve poverty. God, does that sound familiar? Now, I know that sweatshop poverty and gig work poverty is not the same. I'm talking about the social impact it is causing on society. Like we in America started depending on Chinese sweatshops for cheap goods. That's why when you go to Walmart, Dollar Tree, Target, Home Depot, everything's made in China. Or in a country like Vietnam or other countries that have cheap labor. So since they since since the corporate America couldn't export gig work per se, you know. They importing the labor. They importing the gig workers here. See, so this it so so the gig work space is going to become more and more crowded and saturated. See, so yeah, so so it's, so it's basically the same thing in reverse. It's reversing. They're reversing. They're reversing the ex export lord exporting exportation of the labor. Okay, here we go. So necessary for sweatshops to be possible, a mass. Okay, here we go. Certain social econ certain social and economic conditions are necessary for sweatshops to be possible. Number one, a mass of unskilled and unorganized labor. That's the gig economy, guys. That's the gig economy, guys. I'm telling you, we are mobile sweatshops. A mass of unskilled and unorganized laborers, often including children. Management system that neglect the human factor of labor. DoorDash, Uber, Instacart, Ship, Spark. They don't care about the, they don't care about the impact of how it's gonna affect the 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 the, the, the physical and the mental health of the worker. Number three, lack of accountability for poor working conditions or failure of government to intervene on behalf of the workers. Historically, the sweatshop has depended on homework, literally work done in the home. Guys, guys, think about that. That's where the word homework comes from. Before school, There were sweatshops before schools existed in America. So you literally took your work home. That's where the word homework come from because the, because you took your work home. Not school work home, labor work. Homework and the developing of contracting. In the homework system, members of a family receive payment for piecework done in their home or in a residence that had been converted into a small factory and contracting individual workers or groups of workers agree to do a certain job for a certain price. 
So they was making people was people was, were 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 renting out their homes and turning turning them into small factories. And the people would sleep there and work there. Guys, do gig workers sleep and work in their cars? Do are, are, are these well, specifically Uber providing cars for people to work with? Guys, it, it, it's this that's that's that can't be a coincidence, guys. Let's continue. So it said they give them piece work done in their own home or in a residence that had been converted into a small factory. Imagine converting a damn residence into a small factory. Come on, man. Come on, guys. And contracting individual workers or groups of workers agree to do a certain job for a certain price. Sometimes they carry out this contract themselves. Sometimes they sublet it to subcontractors at a lower price. This arrangement can lead to labor exploitation, often of women and children, and in the and in the developed world undocumented workers or recent immigrants you hear that guys you hear that that's what we're going through right now in this country undocumented workers or recent immigrants and this was going on in the 1800s and here we are 200 years later they ramping it up they ramping it up. Erratic employment and poor quality in the final product. And see, and that's what happens when you started bringing undocumented people over here and immigrants. The quality of the work goes down. So that, that affects the people who care about the quality. And that's why the tips go down, guys. The tips are going down because of the impact of undocumented workers that don't care. In Uber, they got they they doing it in Uber. And then you get these companies who sublet out the labor work to not companies, these these organized criminals who sublet out the labor work to recently migrated immigrants. Here we go, guys. Let's continue. When trade is brisk, extremely long hours of work in seriously overcrowded workrooms. When trade is slack, the subcontractors whose overhead costs are far lower than those of factory employee, employees. See, guys, remember, gig work is going to start, start impacting other industries think about it they have gig workers picking up non-medical emergency patients from hospitals from mental institutions from homes they got teenager teenagers getting picked up with uber they have delivery workers that's going to impact fedex it's going to impact ups it's going to impact the postal service because now they got gig workers picking up packages, delivering um, um, products like medical supplies and and automotive supplies and 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 uh, you know other supplies. They got gig workers going and pick, picking these items up when traditionally a company would deliver office supplies. They got gig workers going to Staples and delivering office supplies now. Delivering groceries, clothes. See, see what I'm saying, guys? They have gig workers doing these things now. They got gig workers that drive RVs across the country, drive cars across the country. See, so the gig economy is disrupting a lot of other industries and as this thing play out 
it's going to become more and more disruptive. More and more people are going to become independent contractors. I guarantee you guys in the next 20 years, 50% of Americans are going to be independent contractors. This work from home thing, think about it. We just read it, guys. Work at home is a part of the plan to get people out of the offices. Remote work is the same thing. It's the same thing. So what what, what happens when the remote workers start subcontracting their start subcontracting out their work to other people as a remote worker? That don't mean you have to do it. As long as the work get done. See guys. So here we go, guys. Let's let's continue. Okay. Uh, subcontractors with overhead con costs of are far lower than those of factory workers. Typically, dismiss workers without consideration. Let me read that again. When trade is slack, the subcontractors whose overhead costs are far lower than those of factory employers typically dismiss workers without consideration. One of the earliest objectives of factory and minimum wage legislation was to improve workers' conditions for workers. See, guys, and then in the 19th century, sweatshops were common in manufacturing for shoes, soap, cigars, and artificial flowers. Conditions have tended to be worse in large cities. It's the same with gig economy. The conditions are worse in large cities. Where sweatshops, mobile sweatshops, can be hid in the slum areas. Yes. And no one really wants to work there because it's hazardous in the slum areas. It's dangerous. You can get robbed, carjacked, killed. That's why it's dangerous. Although, here's, although legislation had by... Hold on, God. Let's see, where was I at? Let's see. Hold on, hold on, guys. Conditions have been uh, hidden in the slum. Although legislation had, by the mid middle of the 20th century, controlled sweatshops in most developed countries, the system was still operating in many countries in Asia, where large numbers of people were engaged in homework and in small factory shops. Homework. There we go. Factories, factors contributing to the control of the sweatshop in the 20th century include the growth of national labor laws, pressure from trade unions, the political influence of labor parties, social awareness. See, that's what we're doing. We, we, we got to do with social awareness. That's why the YouTube channels are important to educate the consumer that we are being exploited, and but we don't need you to exploit us even more by lying about the delivery, about not providing tips and trying to man, trying to man, you know abuse and manipulate the delivery drivers or the Uber drivers. We're dealing with enough out here in these streets. And we got the consumer ramping up his his his, his abuse. Okay guys, let's let me finish. Trade part let me see labor law, uh, factories, growth of national labor laws, activism, and on the part of industry, recognition of the efficiency of the factory production and increased interest in human relations. Around the world, international labor organizations have has attempted to, to, to raise labor standards in countries where sweatshops are still coming. Sweatshops in the garment and shoe industry became headline stories in the 1990s when popular American brands were discovered. To have been made in sweatshops in the United States and its territories in overseas factories. That company they're talking about is Nike. Nike, Under Armour, Puma, Adidas. A lot of these. Uh, Levi's, 
leaves, all these clothes were made in sweatshops, guys. And we demanded cheaper and cheaper goods, so we have to we have to participate. I'm telling you, man, that's capital, capital, capitalism in the form that we practice it today is you are forced to participate in a system that you may not agree with. It's abusive. It's oppressive. It's exploitative. Okay, guys. So hold on, hold on, guys. Let me shift. Let me shift real quick. Okay, guys. Let's look at some of the working condition of the gig workers. I'm sure we already know all these things. I just want to make a comparison to sweatshops. We are mobile sweatshops. Unskilled labor that can be easily flood, that can be easily abused and manipulated by the consumer and the unscrupulous corp corporations with very low governance and low oversight. It says lack of benefits. Most gig workers are classified as independent contractors, which means they do not receive traditional employment benefits like health insurance, paid leave, or retirement plans. Income variability. Earnings can fluctuate significantly depending on demand, location, and competition. That's a big one. Related work-related expenses. Gear workers often bear the cost of work-related expenses, such as vehicle maintenance, fuel, and insurance. Algorithmic control. Gig workers are subject to the algorithms of these platforms, which can affect their work availability and earnings. See, so it's similar. It's similar to sweatshops. Here, sweatshop workers. Poor working conditions. Sweatshops are notorious for poor ventilation, overcrowding, lack of sanitation, and unsafe environments. It's sex of hours. Workers often face long hours with mandatory overtime and little rest. Low wages. Wages are typically very low, often below the legal minimum and, and ins insufficient to meet basic living expenses. See, so guys, it can all be tied in. It's not going to be tied in one for one, but it's close enough for where you can see as time goes on, it's going to get worse and worse. See, it took sweatshops been around a long time. The gig, the gig economy is just coming around, and it's already heavily and negatively impacting modern day society in the in the um in the economy. Okay, low uh, health and safety risk. Workers are frequently exposed to dangerous machinery, hazardous materials, and a high risk of injury or illness. See, that's what I'm telling you. Like the the, the humans have very low value we're disposable labor easily replaceable when you can easily replace something that's disposable you don't care about the, its impact you don't care because you're disposable You know, it's just like we, we're just like a diaper. Gig workers and humans in general are like disposable diapers. Use them and throw them away. You don't try to wash disposable diapers. You use them and you throw them away. We are like paper plates, paper cups disposable utensils we just use you use the human and throw them away a depreciating liability let me finish guys job security gig workers Precarious employment, gig workers lack job security and can be 
deactivated from platforms without significant recourse. Market dependency. Their income is highly dependent on market demand platform policies. Sweatshop workers. High turnover. Sweatshop workers also face job insecurity with high turnover and rates and little job stability. Temporary contracts. Many are employed on short-term contracts or casual laborers, making long-term employment uncertain. Same thing with gig work. It's, it's uncertain. I mean, and even, even if after you do it for so long, you don't have it's it's unskilled work, so you can't take you can't transfer that skill anywhere else. And it's unhealthy because you're eating bad and you're sitting down all day, and you're dealing with the psychological and emotional stress of dealing with passengers, traffic, road rage, restaurants. You just it just there's so many elements that will drive you mad. That no same person will do this long term. Legal and social protection. Gig workers. Limited legal protections. As independent contractors, gig workers are not protected by many labor laws that apply to employees, such as minimum wage laws, anti-discrimination protection, and workers' compensation. Emerging advocacy. There are gr growing advocacy and legal action to improve protection and rights to gig workers, including reclassification efforts and platform accountability. Sweatshop workers, which is similar to what we're going through. Weak enforcement in many developing countries, labor laws that exist but are poorly enforced, leaving workers vulnerable to exploitation. Social and economic impact. Gig workers, gig economy growth. The gig economy has grown rapidly, offering new income opportunities, but also contributing to the rise of precarious employment. Impact on traditional jobs. The gig economy can undermine traditional employment models, affecting job st stability and benefits in various sectors. Sweatshop workers. Economic contribution. Sweatshops con contribute significantly to the e economies of developing countries by providing jobs and supporting exports. Social cost. The exploitation and poor work conditions in sweatshops perpetuate cycles of poverty and inequality. Cycles of poverty and inequality. So what can an unskilled delivery person offer their children? I see parents had their children with them driving for Uber, doing Instacart, doing delivery drivers. They had their children with them delivering McDonald's, delivering Chick-fil-A, delivering Starbucks, delivering Chipotle. Delivering from all these stores. They had their children with them. This is what they're teaching their children how to do. Come on, guys. It's going to be very hard to compete with the, those people. With our standards of living, we, we have to lower our standards of living in order to compete with the immigrants. Guys, we are mobile sweatshops. We got to just face the facts, guys. In conclusion, guys, let's finish this up. Both gig workers and sweatshop workers face significant challenges in exploitation, though in different contexts. Gig workers often struggle with the instability and lack of protection associated with independent contract status, while sweatshop workers endure harsh, unsafe working conditions and extremely low wages. Addressing these issues requires targeted efforts, including stronger labor protections, corporate accountability, and advocacy for workers' rights in both gig and traditional manufacturing sectors. So yeah, guys, we got, we have a long ways to go, guys. You have to take you have to take responsibility for the position that you're in. We have to own up to this, man. It's getting worse. It's not going to get any better. So you have to manage your lifestyle, your expenses accordingly. You know, you got to do what's best for you guys. You have to do what's best for you. The social norm in this country 
it's going down. Like we, we, there's there's not going to be a social norm. People are going to be just be living and doing whatever they can to survive. Which we're, we're in survival mode, guys. I'm in monk mode and survival mode at the same time. You know, we're gonna have to build a hole. We're, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to dig a hole in the ground, guys. We we'll have to dig a hole in the ground. I mean, you know, it's, it's not it's not gonna be easy out here. But we're gonna maintain our high frequency, our positive attitude, and our motivation, guys. We're gonna maintain our high frequency, our positive attitude, and our motivation because that's what's gonna get us over these times. Yes, dark times are coming. Yes, dark times are coming. But we know we have we know there's light at the end of the tunnel. So keep your flashlights charged. Keep your mind focused. Keep your third eye open. And the universe will provide a way for us for us to manifest the things that we know that we deserve. You gotta stay positive, guys. You got to remain faithful. Always faithful. Simplify, guys. That's a marine term, to be always faithful. Stay, stay persistent. Keep your, keep, you know, just keep your head down and be humble. Humans always repeat history in different forms. But when you recognize it and you see the monster, another head growing from the three-headed monster, when you see another head growing, you got to take notice. And you got to start pivoting your life accordingly. Read the book, Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson. You got to learn how to pivot and move accordingly, guys. All right, guys, that's it. Now go and conquer yourself.